Bastard! Der Bastard! This stampede is not caused by an incident the people are running away from, far from it. It is a free-for-all and hundreds have come from far and near to this warehouse in Oshun State, southwest Nigeria, to help themselves. The foodstuff being carted away was stored by Kakovid, a private sector initiative supporting the fight to mitigate the effects of the coronavirus. But to these people, at a time when they are feeling the crunch of the lockdown, first from COVID-19, then the end SARS protests, Christmas has come early bearing gifts. Still in the southwest, some looters in a kitty state invaded the federal government silos and the Agric Development Program warehouse in the Dirkiti, the state capital, looting bagged items and other materials. In their large numbers, the people besieged locations apparently to cart away food items, especially COVID palliatives, have been witnessed in some other states across the country. Apparent surprise and delight also hit residents in Calabar, the Cross River State capital, and no one wants to miss out on the opportunity. Same excitement is experienced in Kwara State, North Central, where another car COVID warehouse stored in a cargo terminal at the state airport has seen hundreds flooding in and out with their loot. Meanwhile, the warehouse storing emergency COVID-19 palliatives suffered the same fate in the Kuru, just south local government area of Plateau State. The storage houses various items ranging from grains, pasta and agricultural equipment. The expectation of people is that the food materials donated by the Kakovid drive would have been distributed but this discovery leaves many wondering why all this foodstuff was not directed to those in need of it. And perhaps more interestingly, who are those responsible to explain this? Welcome back. Well, uh, just to shed light on some of those images that you might have seen, what could have gone wrong, uh, how did uh, what happened happen, and uh, moving forward, what could or uh, might or should be done, we've got uh, Toyosi Akerile Ogunshiji, who is a chairperson of Victim Support Fund, COVID-19 Task Force. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you very much for having me, Shamali. Well, yes, we do know that you are of the Victim Support Fund. That's and right. we know that, yes, what you're doing is out there for people to see. That's right. But you know, looking at those images, they're just questions. You just ask questions of who, who you see right in front of you or the neighbor and next person, yeah. if the relevant persons are not just there. But I mean, at least you have a huge idea of how this thing should have been done from examples of what you have done. So you do have an understanding of what's happening. So tell us from your perspective what you see. How come we're where we are today? Uh, I mean, thank you very much, uh, Shamley. Uh, first, it's important for me to provide some context. Uh, the Victim Support Fund was set up in June 2014 as a private sector-led humanitarian initiative supposed to provide psychosocial support, economic empowerment, education, and rehabilitation and resettlement for victims of terrorism and insurgency in the Northeast. And so our work over the last five to six years have basically covered Borno, Yobe, Adamawa, Taraba, Gombe, and a few, you know, we've made some interventions in the IDP camp in Ohogwa in Edo State. 
Um, and so this happens to be the very first time that the Victim Support Fund is coming out of its typical intervention locations, you know, um, within the Northeast to other parts of Nigeria. And uh, that credit has to go to General T.Y. Dan Juma retired, who was the chairman of the Victim Support Fund, who um, inaugurated the 1 billion naira COVID-19 VSF fund in, on the 30th of March 2020 and appointed me a chairperson alongside five of my colleagues on the VSF uh, committee. And our mandate was very simple, ensure that we go around the country um, and cushion the effects of the impact of COVID-19, cushion the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups and families and indigent, you know, households around the country. So we had um, a very short period of time to design a framework around how do we go into communities and support Nigerians. And the first thing we did was, of course, begin from, you know, the Northeast. So we began from Borno, Adamawa, Yube, Taraba, you know, Abuja and also focus on Lagos and Ogun State because they were the frontline COVID-19 locations at that time. But even beyond that, the first thing we did was to work on a needs assessment. Because one of the problems of you know, um, in humanitarian coordination in Nigeria is you don't, it's, it's not just appropriate to sit down and assume that this is what, what the people need. Um, it's, important to, right yeah, it's important to engage stakeholders, design a needs assessment framework so that your solution is tailor-made to the needs of the people. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee the judicious management and allocation of resources. So how do you, how do you get that done? I mean, it's easy from your primary location. Very, very good. But like I said, the VSF has been working. I think that aside from the United Nations and a few other international organizations, if you just take a drive from... Meiduguri into Bama, Jetete, Monguno, Magumeri, Goza, any part of the Northeast. That's, those are Bruno locations I mentioned. Or you go into Buniyadi or anywhere in Yobe, or you go into Michika, Madagali, Nadamawa. I think Victim Support Fund is the most visible organization. If you, you'd see kids on the streets carrying our VSF school bags, you'd see schools that we rebuilt, schools that we furnished, hospitals we built, hospitals, teaching hospitals we supported to provide prenatal, postnatal care for pregnant women in the middle of the you know, Boko Haram insurgencies. And so we had existing data and we had partners that we'd been working with across those locations. Yeah, yeah. In locations like Lagos and yeah. Ugu, or Edo, or Enugu, or Eboin, or Ekiti, where we'd never worked. We leveraged on our networks to be able to find local NGO partners and community-based organizations. So the resources were split into two. 50% goes to the government, 50% goes to NGOs, with whom we even signed compliance agreements and state specific timelines to be able to protect you know, our own, I mean, to manage the reputational risk that comes with allocation of resources without reporting constantly to the public what that money is used for. So at the end of the day, our needs assessment showed that food was the primary need of Nigerians at the time, followed by PPEs like you know, surgical face masks. And then we needed to support healthcare centers as well. So we donated latex gloves, surgical face masks, safety boots, we bought hand sanitizers. We also invested a lot in watch facilities, hygiene and sanitation to disinfect public surfaces within those locations. Yeah, you, 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 you talked about collaborating with some NGOs. Absolutely. Um, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, fix my head. I mean, trying to compare in Lagos, what your, for example. Ju just one moment, yeah. just to compare what you are doing as VSF and what may have gone wrong from the images that are in public space right. about COVID That's donations right. and all of that. Um, you also made some donations from what you just said. You right. also made some donations to the state government Absolutely. as well. Um, you have ways of verifying compliance with NGOs. Is there any such a plan with the state government as well? Now, it was a cross-cutting, you know, um, monitoring and evaluation system we put in place. Okay. So we have a very solid data-driven monitoring and evaluation team at the VSF. Because one of the things that you don't want to do when you are, co co you know, um, coordinating humanitarian so support, especially to indigent households, in a country with a huge trust deficit between people in positions of authority, and the led, and you know, and the citizens, if you like, it was important to ensure that transparency, accountability, and probity from the beginning of the budgeting, the pro the purchasing, and you know, the handover to the states. Let me give an example. In Lagos State, for example, we gave we we had two different warehouses. One was Lagos State government assigned to us to you know hand over all the items, split into two. Their medical warehouse was separate from with the warehouse where we put all the food items. But we also had our own VSF warehouse where we could control the items we we're going to package and give to our NGOs. And then we mandated one of our NGO partners as a monitoring and evaluation 
you know, organization to supervise the donations of Lagos State. Not because we didn't trust them, but we, we cannot, what we cannot, what we don't evaluate, we cannot control. And what we cannot control, we cannot report. And what we cannot report, we cannot confirm to the public. Mm. So what we did was, ap apart from handing over the food, we had an idea of who did they want to give. The quantities were announced, the number of households we were targeting with the rice, the beans, the gari, the vegetable oil, and all of that. It was received by the Commission of Information um, of Agriculture, along with the Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Agriculture. Okay. And we also set timelines about how we wanted, we, we also had a standard profiling of the people we wanted our donations to target. People that didn't have employment, people that survived Did you also only find, on daily income. Were, were, there, uh, were you also able to confirm whether or not they were actually distributed? Yes, I participated in some of the distributions. If you go to uh, my social media pages, as the chairperson of the Victim Support Fund COVID-19 Tax Force, myself, were on the, I was on the street along with the NGOs. In fact, Mrs. Kalesonwo, who is like, um, she, she works in the Ministry of Women Affairs. Um, and uh, Abisola Lusoya, who's the um, acting honorable commissioner for Agri, called me. We were constantly in touch to know exactly who the people that received our food items. So the people that received it from Lagos State were mainly widows, you know, indigent women within different across local governments. We also focused on indigent local governments with dense population with a, we know, but, uh, of indigent people. So we did Alimo Shaw, we did Amu or Dauphin. We even went to Riverine communities in Apapa, you know, partnered with Rethinking Cities, Lagos Food Bank, Mama Money, many of those, you know, NGOs that were already, Koku Foundation, who were already at the epicenter of supporting communities with food and medicals in the middle of the pandemic. You know, when you say you, you, you know, handed certain things to the state government. That's right. But you still found it necessary to have your own uh, VSF. Yes. You set up something yes. as well. Why was that? Because, I mean, you also had ways to monitor what was going on. Why did you have to have a second one? I thought, I, we, we thought it was important because, number one, the state is the legitimate institution in any, in any, in any location that you go in this country. So in the middle of a pandemic, you are going into a state to do, make donations. You cannot, you cannot but engage the state. We understand that Nigerians have, Nigerians have legitimate concerns about not trusting government. But government still remains the statutory authority. So you can't go into a state and just go and make donations without engaging the instrument of state, as it were. But it was our responsibility to ensure that whatever it is we gave the government was not just kept in warehouses, was, was not just donated and handed over to people, but were handed over to the profile of the type of people we wanted it to reach. Like, we wanted it to get into the hands of the people within a period of time. Because we also know that these are perishable goods that can go bad, and it will be a reputational risk for the VSL. A few people open uh, bags of food, and they were already spot or they were expired, or whatever. And our, our food bags were also carefully branded, you know, so you could clearly de this, you know, um, decipher the discrepancies between us and any other, you know, um, organization, private or public, that was making donations. So your, there was no warehouse of yours that was looted? Um, and you can quote me on national television that at the moment, we don't have any palliatives in any warehouse in this country. I'm the chairperson and um, I've spoken to my colleagues. We've called, I mean, we, I can confidently say that between April and June, all our palliatives were donated. E even if all of the, the only things that were left us at July were hand sanitizers and a few things in some of the southeast states. But mm. then we also made sure that you know, they were donated to the hospitals, the medical centers, and you know, to healthcare workers. What, what? Jane, when, since you participated in doing some of the distributions, That's right. can you gauge what the level of need is? <laughs> um, the scale and the scope of need in this country only requires a very systematic and procedural approach to eliminating poverty. I still constantly say that there is no country or society that will provide education and jobs and skills empowerment for the bulk of its population. And those people will choose begging on the streets or choose terrorism as their viable alternative. Um, we had a one billion naira fund that covered seven states in phase one, and we had 832,743,412 naira for phase two. And 
one of the things that we noticed was 1.8 billion is a lot of money. But if you break it down to 12 states, to also include the fact that we donated telesurveillance and conferencing equipment to the National Center for Disease Control, because at the time, a lot of people couldn't travel from across the country, and we, we wanted to be able to boost the capacity of the NCDC to coordinate their data monitoring and management system from Abuja across all the 36 states. So we donated those equipments to them. We also invested in the National Pandemic Response Action Plan of the Federal Ministry of Health. We provided support for the Administrial Expert Advisory Committee. In fact, we fully equipped with printers and computers the COVID-19 Secretariat of the Federal Ministry of Health. The Victim Support Fund COVID-19 Tax Force did that. If you break 1.8 million down, on the average you have 150 million naira per state. And then you want to break it down to 10. By the way, I must mention that for us it wasn't just an issue of donations. We were very particular about the dignity of our intended beneficiaries. So I make bold to say that perhaps we are the best packet palliatives in this country. We had 10 kg rice, 10 kg beans, 10 kg gari, 10 kg maize. Vegetable oil was not one liter, it was four liters. Salt was two kg. Mm. And our, 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 our hand sanitizers came in 250 mils, 125 mils. I, I, I want so, you I mean, to, for us. No, I, I want you to please you yes. know, help me get to that issue. That, yeah. um, from what you saw, that's right. What's the scale or the scope or <laughs> the gap of need that you saw going round to this So place? I walked into a locality in Badagre. We had gone with one of our partners, Rack Development Foundation, and we wanted to target people with disabilities because it was also a very inclusive intervention process. So dwarfs, people with disabilities, women, widows, men, you know, young people, uh, artisans. We, 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 you know, we had a very strategic you know, mapping of who it is we wanted to target across the local government. We were also very... Um, we were conscious that there was no way we could feed the whole of Lagos or feed the whole of any state. So what we did was to make sure that how do we maximize the impact of our resources within those locations. When I walked into Badagri, I mean, my heart broke. Um, there, were, there were places that we went to and um, they said that nobody had come to those communities to give them anything at all in the last, I mean, you, you, you can go to my Instagram or VSF Instagram page to see old, old people, like really, really old aged people. Um, if, if, if I had anything that I had, I would go back there with my personal funds. And I want to encourage Nigerians that this is not the sole responsibility of government. The, the, the fact that we're constantly going to have indigent people within us, within our society, means that there has to be a more deliberate and intentional yeah. approach to providing social protection for our people. The scope and the scale of the need is so much that whatever it is you give is like a drop in the ocean. Yeah. But you and know, then it's also temporary because yeah. how long would 10 kg and 10 kg rice that, and, and, and that, that's part last of the for a family, an average Nigerian family of a father, a mother, a fortune? Yeah. But you know, we're trying to understand how come some of these items didn't get to the people because as we saw, over there for days now on ending. We've seen different parts yeah. of the country. Yeah. Because I'm just looking at your own strategy yeah. to see what happened, how you were able to ensure that it got to the That's people right. who wanted it. Because today, some dailies are reporting that uh, officials are saying, no, we didn't ask the states to wait for approval before distributing <laughs> anything. That's right. So states are saying, well, they, these things were here. We didn't hear from them. They wanted us to wait until certain times. And so it's going back and forth. What do you think could have gone wrong? See, Shambling, um, I'm, I, I, don't know, I don't know much about the internal processes of you know, the government or Kakovic, so I'm unable to make very informed, broad, comprehensive comments on that. But I, I know that, you know, I had granted an interview to the International Center for Investigative Reporting about in September. And they had asked me what some of our challenges were at the Victim Support Fund COVID-19 Tax Force. And I said one of them were, the perhaps underlying bureaucratic you know, processes that could greet some of interventions like this. Mm -hmm. And you see, I don't, I don't hold brief for any government official. You know, I don't have the capacity to do that. But I also know that leadership you know, requires, sometimes you need to have your boots on the ground yourself. You can't simply delegate responsibility and say, go and do this without checking. But I also want us to be slightly lenient with the people at the very top of making these decisions. A first lady of one of the states where we donated called me two days ago to provide me explanations on what happened and all of that. And said, look, VSF, you people came. You gave us a letter. 
You gave us a date. You met. You came with the date. You gave us a list of NGOs. You gave us agreements. We were clear about what you wanted to do and who you wanted to hand over your food items and all of that. Too. I think perhaps what we should be looking at going forward is what are some of the critical learning points. And at the Victim Support Fund, we're happy to you know share our notes with other organizations who may want to do these sort of things in the future. Mm. However, I I understand that you know um, some of the food items. Our food items at the Victim Support Fund were already bagged in 10 kg. We bagged each of the rice, beans, gari, and everything in 10 kg, and then put each into a 50 kg bag mm -hmm. per family. I understand that some of the other you know, private donations were brought in 50 kg or 10 kg, and then the, some of the states wanted to rebag them into smaller Perhaps, sizes to yeah. ensure that it could spread and go around because that, to I was larger ask, populations. Because some of them said they wanted to rebag. Yes. So I was going to ask, what was the point of trying to rebag? Because, I mean, if you give 50 kg food item to... Um, I mean, we gave 10 kg, for example. So 50 kg means you've given the food of supposedly five families to one family. Yeah, so why didn't they get it right from, from the first instance? Well, again, that's why, I said, uh, that's why I said I'm unable to make broad comments on that, but we're happy to share our notes at the Victim Support Fund about could what could mm. have yeah. you know, been done better. But I don't want to make a sweeping generalization yeah. that, but, that the reason why the COVID-19 palliatives were seen in the warehouse were, was because state government officials wanted to steal it, could or, it be? or COVID was irresponsible. I don't think no, so. No, no, no. Could it be because, I mean, uh, COVID is a product of circumstance. Could it be because you, your, your organization, already had a system in place, but COVID was just, you know, something that happened and they did Well, well it's possible, but if you also look at the profile of the people who lead COVID, they're extremely, you know, knowledgeable, accomplished Nigerians in their own different rights. So you can't really call the, their competence to question because something went wrong here. I think that, you know, I like to focus on the solutions. Um, and I constantly am emphasizing the fact that we're happy to share our notes at the Victim Support Fund about how data-driven monitoring and accountability can ensure that things like this do not happen you know, in the future. Um, I feel that maybe communication is also um, very important. Communication where? Um, communication, you know, vice versa, from the government to Kakovit to Kakovit to, 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 to the government. Maybe, um, I don't know what could have happened along the way, but like I said, I don't want to completely you know, make a sweeping generalization that, oh, the palliatives were going to be stolen. However, I have reservations about certain public officials who came out to say they were planning to... Sh okay, how do you hold Lagos State government, for example, responsible for palliatives that were shared to members of the leadership of the state to distribute? And some one of them said he was keeping it to share it on his birthday. Like, how do you... How does the governor... Who is in the middle of managing an, a crisis that has stemmed out of, you know, things that be spiraled out of his control? How do you hold him responsible for for that? And again, it goes to the very heart of our public recruit, you know, our recruitment process into public service. You can call a governor and a minister out as much as you like, but we also need to hold to account the people within that funnel of you know, representation in the ministries, in the government. Mm -hmm. The governor can sit in his office and say, I want these food items distributed to this. But you have people who have their own agenda about what they want to do. Okay. Will it help? And I, I'm not as busy as a governor, so it's easy for me to be going around location to location, sharing rice and you, you talked about data, and it's I'm something... I'm monitoring along with my colleagues. <laughs> you talked about data the other yes. time, and uh, it's something we also Absolutely. open our conversation mm -hmm. with. Um, that's something a number of people have also complained about. Yes. That we don't have a, a, a developmental data, so to speak. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have a social diary, social a social protection diary, documentation, uh, social welfare, yeah. whatever which one can put it. Uh, maybe that would have helped to know the vulnerable families, the vulnerable individuals. But, but and you all can't of that. say we don't have. We that if the government needs data in this country, there are credible non-profits community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, which is what we did, leverage existing networks and build and leverage their capacity. I didn't know, as chairperson, I didn't know any of the NGOs that we gave food in Ebo, in Enugu or anywhere. But we have people that work in these locations that you can call up and say, who are the top five NGOs in this state? We want to distribute food. You know stakeholders in those states, call them up. We want to see their records. We're using working with South Saharan Foundation in Enugu or you know, Professor Joy Zelo's NGO in Enugu and all of that was not my decision. We have a monitoring and evaluation team that has the responsibility 
of carefully selecting and verifying which NGOs we distribute through. And we don't just do that. We are documenting in photographs and videos and publishing reports. All our NGO partners, in fact, concerned parents and educators to whom we gave the food for teachers in Ethiopia and local government, had a 36-page report. Koku Foundation, all of them had their reports. If you, I mean, if you want to see some of them, we, 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 some of them are published on the Victim Support Fund uh, website. So the other reason why we also made sure we worked with NGOs and government is also for checks and balances. Because government can check the NGOs, the NGOs can check the government. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, the media, you know, the media management around it is very crucial. So yes, a lot of people mistaking uh, some of, you know, VSF or other organizations. Uh, people are camping on my page, on VSF page, defending us that, look, we were watching every state. We saw the TV reports and saw everything you handed over. We saw you distributing. So I think that constant, you know, briefing of the public is very important to engender public trust. Let me bring this in as we wind down. You know, when we talk about the scale of what's required. Mm. Because looking at the sea of heads there, yeah. let me ask this hypothetical question. Now, assuming they got it right and got to the people who really needed it, they'll still at never the bottom, feed, they'll still never be able to You will still never have met it. It means that, look, we still might have had people who will they still will, come out, even if you met the even people the who Bible needed it. Even the Bible says that we're always going to have the poor amongst us. I missed us. Wow. We, they, even if all of the food you saw in all of those places, you can only hypothetically analyze what the quantities in those warehouses could be. But I'm a, I'm a data scientist. I, I would only focus on numbers. If I don't have my facts and my fingers, I'm unable to make you know, blanket statements that then indict me as not making informed commentary on issues I know nothing about. For me, that data is very important. When I talk about the data at the VSF, it is so granular to who is. In fact, we have, if you go to our social media pages, you'd see our data collection cards. The name, the, the address, the local government, your phone number. So you can actually randomly call anybody up and say, did you get any VSF food? So we can know which NGO is playing pranks or not. But having seen what is going on in different parts of the country, do you think that people can ever trust distribution of some of these items? Because it appears as if it's taking a massive Chamberlain, the trust around distribution of palliatives is just, it's, it's, it's just, um, it, <laughs> it's a minute component of the grand trust deficit between our, you know, the leaders of, of people in positions of authority and, people, and the led. I think, the God, I think, you see, people will trust you when, they are, when you carry them along. Constant information, constant clarification, constant briefing. One of the things that we did very well at the VSF was that at the beginning, the moment General Danjuma inaugurated the Victim Support Fund Tax Force, we announced the money immediately. We didn't say victims of what fund tax force is going out to intervene. We announced that we have one billion. This is the state we're going to be covering. This is the breakdown of what we are buying. So anybody can sit in their homes anywhere in Nigeria and do the mathematics of how we're going to spend that money. And then the problem is also that a lot of Nigerians hear billions and trillions. They don't eventually see what that money is used for. So you have a responsibility to say, I have one billion. This one billion is going to social number of states. If you break it down, this is what we are buying with those states. At the point of purchase, this is the warehouse. These are the trucks coming in. Constant briefing because, you see, you heal a nation when you, you, you make the people feel like they count. That's why democracy is a government for the people, by the, for the people, by the people and of the people. So if you don't constantly you know, make sure that the citizens are actively engaged, it's not just about distributing palliatives. Nigerians don't trust people in positions of authority on anything at all. People now see me, even though I'm, I'm leading a private sector intervention, people feel that. People are calling me out to be accountable, and I'm saying that leadership is about accountability. And I don't mind subjecting myself to that public scrutinization process. Because if you ask me questions, I will provide you all of the facts. And I think that that is what, you know, people that have been saddled with responsibility, like, they have not done anything much over the last six months. And my colleagues have invested more time. I mean, we traveled to, to well, I had to go to Badagi by boat. Mm -hmm. So when people see that, you know, you, you, you yourself are participating actively in that yeah. process, you know, it, it, so, right. it somewhat gives them some, some of, you know, some form of confidence that, you know, you are not just, you, you, you've not just kept the money somewhere. They can see what the money is actually well, used for. Communication is very key. 
Uh, sure. In all of this, as you've highlighted, which we always talk about here time and again, how they need to keep talking to yeah. the people. But sometimes they think that uh, we seem to be making a mountain out of a molehill. But there you have it now. But we do thank you for coming on. Thank you very uh, much, Toyosi Cameron. Toyosi Akerele Ogunshiji is the chairperson, Victim Support Fund COVID-19 Task Force. We will be back in a moment. Don't go away.